Gateway program. So uh, it looks like we're recording now. Um, our uh, semester long faculty led study away programs um, that have been designed and implemented by PLU. So these programs are unique in many ways, which our fabulous program directors will begin to talk about here shortly. Um, but just to note a few characteristics, all programs are aligned with PLU values and PLU's curriculum. Participants generally are in a group with other PLU students, which can be really helpful to have a group of, of supporters with you there um, pre, during, and then after your study away experience. Additionally, Gateway programs charge the PLU comprehensive fee, which is PLU's tuition, room and board, and, and students get to take all of their regular aid. So, PLU gift aid, state, federal, whatever you have, you get to take on that program as well. Um, for, that ex or for, for that fee, students receive their education expenses, um, room and, or their housing, food. They also get a $750 flight credit. Um, all visa processing fees are included, and there's also um, emergency health insurance. Uh, some study tours are also included on some programs. So going forward, each program director will provide an overview of their program. And while they're speaking, um, you can feel free to write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. And we'll be sure to answer those by the end of their segment. Now, if you don't get a chance to ask your question, we'll also have a Q&A at the very end of everybody's uh, presentation. So with with that, we're going to kick it off with Chengdu, China, um, and I'm going to hand it over to Paul Manfredi, Dr. Pa Paul Manfredi, who's the program director for the Chengdu, China Gateway Program. Okay, greetings, everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for joining us. I'm delighted that there are people who are interested in um, these programs, all of them. They're all terrific, uh, and possibly in China in particular. Um, I am going to aim for about five minutes, and I'm actually going to try and keep myself honest by putting a little timer on because I have a tendency to go over. <laughs> but um, I, in particular, want to leave some time for questions um, at the at the end uh, or, or whenever that's that's convenient. So, um, to launch right in, uh, I also want to say that there are some logistical kind of structural questions that are very well answered by uh, the Wong Center. Um, Bryn and others, and so I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get too much into that. I'm going to say a couple of things that um, maybe would be particular to my perspective as the site director, um, and they are very much in response to some questions that were were, were posed uh, to set up this event. So uh, there are four of them specifically, and the first one is which qualities, or um, what qualities would would somebody interested in this program um, have? And uh, I think I could reduce those simply to two, principally one. Curiosity, I think that's critical, of course, to anybody who wants to study anything. Um, but uh, maybe particularly in the case of the students who might want to go to China, uh, and related to curiosity, um, or as I think perhaps part of curiosity, would be a tolerance for difference, I think. And so I'm going to start with, with that. Um, China, uh, for those who are born and raised in the United States, among other places in the world, of course, um, <clears throat> presents a very different picture of things um, on, in some respects, fundamental levels. And I think that that's something that has always intrigued me uh, and continues to be my experience after these many years of going to China. So one um, very basic example of that um, would be that uh, when you go to China, there is food everywhere. Food is, is such a fundamental part of Chinese experience um, and, and, and being there. Uh, and I hope I don't step on any toes when I say this, but uh, when I come back to the United States, I, I find myself wondering what is there to eat? So um, I, I starve when I'm here and I'm satiated beyond uh, all capacity <laughs> when I'm in China. And then by contrast, when I come back to the United States, I find um, the air is wonderful uh, to breathe and the water is clean. And when you get to China, um, for those of you who, who may be interested in going, be aware that sometimes you simply can't breathe. So on this very fundamental level, um, China presents kind of this, this, this realm of difference that's always there. I don't want to say a lot about this, um, but oh, uh, kind of developing from the other event that the Wong Center held just yesterday on the subject of COVID-19, um, that presents another really spectacular, and I think, although COVID is an awful thing, of course, a really wonderful example for how these two places are different. 
Um, for those of you who are not aware or don't realize, uh, the COVID situation in China is now almost completely, utterly under control. There are still some mask wearing, but basically life has returned entirely to normal. By contrast, um, we have what we have uh, presently in the United States. And so before anybody thinks that um, I'm suggesting that they did a good job and we did a bad job, that's true in a, in, to a degree, but the reasons for that are actually what's quite interesting. So in order for China to get to the situation where COVID is under control, they had to put in place absolutely draconian measures such that uh, businesses, all economic, everything stopped. Um, and uh, in many respects, healthcare stopped. And so um, I don't think we will ever get a full account, but it's arguable that uh, a lot of people, a great number of people died as a consequence of COVID that didn't even have COVID in the Chinese um, circumstance. And um, so that raises two points. One, that China is able to do something on a kind of draconian level that the United States is not, uh, but also just the differences between our two societies. We not only can't do that, I don't think, but we really wouldn't want to because of who we are, because we are a, a society, a culture that uh, sort of celebrates difference and focuses on individual liberty and the kinds of things that the Chinese society um, in some respects does not. But is that really the answer to the question? I don't think so. So um, once again, COVID is a spectacular and very interesting example of how the United States and China are fundamentally different. And students who are interested in going there encounter that difference and being open to that difference in a really neutral and non sort of uh, judgmental or sort of value judgment way uh, is, is the kind of student who I think would be really interested in this program. What do you learn when you're in China? Question number two, uh, well, an awful lot of Chinese. So the, the core part of the, uh, of the program is to study Chinese. There's no prerequisite language ability. You begin at the absolute beginning or you can begin at a very advanced level. The language program is gigantic um, within Sichuan University and is scalable at all levels. So you spend a lot of time learning Chinese and then also about China. And then of course about the differences uh, that I was just mentioning a moment ago. How does one engage, question number three, um, when you're in China? Uh, and this is a really interesting question. Um, there may be some differences that have developed. Well, that's the end of my five, so I'm going to continue in for, for at least one more. There may be some fundamental differences that have developed over time, but I think basically speaking, you could say that the Chinese people, particularly in the region where our, our, our uh, program is located, are quite curious in people from the outside. So that would be our students. So most students who are studying in China um, in our program will find that Chinese people are interested in them and want to engage with them in many occasions, even if you're just walking out on the street, if you're hanging around. Um, in a noodle shop or whatever it is, you find a lot of opportunity to engage with uh, the random person on the street. And that's a wonderful attribute of the program. Beyond that, um, in a somewhat more structured fashion, there's something that we call English Corner, which is um, a longstanding tradition. It is a place within the Sichuan University campus where our program is located, where people who are interested in studying English and encountering people principally from the West, but also from elsewhere, will join and practice um, their English language ability, but also um, make, make friends and, and whatnot. In some cases, we have internships that we can set up through the program. That's also an excellent way to engage. Um, it can be a challenge, and I don't want to get into the challenges of the program, but um, some students, for instance, in the past who uh, have been very, very interested and, um, uh, let's say, uh, invested and committed to their internships find that balancing the study um, uh, and their Chinese language classes and whatnot becomes a challenge. But that is certainly an opportunity that we can pursue um, on, on a variety of bases. Um, and then uh, finally, the community of language learners in the language program is gigantic and literally from across the planet. So those are also opportunities to engage with students from literally all over the world, which a lot of students take advantage of. I'll just say in the fourth question, the final, what I've mentioned tends to be the favorite parts for our students. So um, all of those are opportunities and uh, our students have made, made great learning experiences out of each and every one of them. Thank you so much, Dr. Manfredi. All right, and next we will hear about the Oaxaca Gateway Program from Dr. Tamara Williams, who's the Executive Director for the Wong Center and also the Program Director for the Oaxaca Program. Thank you, Brandon. I know you're helping with the PowerPoint, so we'll give some visual images. First of all, thank you, Brandon Holly, for organizing this panel 
And one of the silver linings of um, this COVID-19 crisis is the fact that I don't think I've ever sat on a panel with my colleague program directors and heard them speak about uh, their programs. So this is a really wonderful opportunity to do this. So I will try to go through my presentation quickly like Paul did um, and let you know um, uh, some of the features that are most important. So Bren, to help us coordinate, I'll just say next slide um, and that will help. So we can start with the next slide. <laughs> Great, so first of all, where is Oaxaca? Oaxaca is in the southwestern part of the country. You can see it, it's the big yellow state. It shares borders with Chiapas to the south and the state of Guerrero to the north. Um, it does have a Pacific coast, but the actual location of the program is at around 5,000 feet in the central part of the state. Um, it's a beautiful, um, beautiful weather most of the year with a very intense rainy season, just as the program begins in August, September, and October. So Oaxaca is a fall semester program. And it is um, um, designed for students, we can move to the next slide. It is designed for students that um, have uh, interest really in perfecting their Spanish. It's a Spanish immersion program. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about the coursework. So why would a student, uh, why Oaxaca? Why did we choose Oaxaca? It's an ideal location for the study of Spanish language, first of all, but also for students that are really interested in Latin American studies writ large. Uh, because of the program's focus on economic development, indigenous communities, human rights, migration, uh, and the environment, the city is, is beautiful, manageable, and relatively free of any violence, um, uh, certainly relative to other of the locations where we have gateways. And as a place to study Latin American studies, it's, it's a unique location uh, and very different really from other parts of Mexico, but similar to other parts of Latin America. So to give you an idea, the average daily income per worker at this point is about $5 a day, uh, but there's 25% of the active workforce in Oaxaca that actually makes no money and lives on a barter system. It has a relatively high infant mortality rate, uh, lack um, lack of availability of, of medical care. Um, also, it's the home to 16 linguistically and culturally distinct indigenous communities and also uh, extraordinary biodiversity. So it was selected really um, very intentionally as a place where students could learn about many of the challenges that are faced by Oaxaca, but also many regions in Latin America. Thanks you, Br thank you, Bryn. So the program is des designed as a Spanish intensive program. So students uh, must have completed Hispanic Studies 202 or the equivalent. Um, and I think generally, if, you're, if a student is interested in a Spanish immersion program and they're weighing other options, for example, the program in Granada, which is also an intensive Spanish course, um, this program is really for students who are interested in Latin America, in development issues, in indigenous rights, in women's rights, social justice, and the push-pull factors affecting migration. It, it was created from the very beginning with these topics in mind. And it's also uh, a unique program, I'll talk about this a little bit uh, in a minute, in that we do offer a pretty robust internship opportunity. So between the Spanish immersion and the internship, it's a program that helps students distinguish them, their candidates, uh, candidacy from others when they're applying to graduate school or professional school. And in fact, we're very proud of the fact that several of our Oaxaca grads have gone on to become Fulbrights and, and participate in Peace Corps, for example, and are also um, doing amazingly pro amazing professional work. Thanks, Bryn. So I'll move on, I'll try to move on quickly. Also for, quest for students that have burning questions, like how can we better serve the growing Mexican and Latinx communities in our midst? What are the root causes of poverty in the world? What are the root causes of migration? And how do others in the world find hope to address chronic issues related to poverty and justice and environmental degradation? The students that join this program generally have those kinds of questions. Thanks, Bren. 
So the program coursework is fairly straightforward and it's very integrated into PLU's Hispanic Studies and Latino Studies program and other programs. So as you can see, the coursework for the, for the program consists of an intensive, which is Hispanic Studies 301 and 403. Um, also, Hispanic Studies 325 or 433, so it's a split literature class. Anthropology, art, uh, biodiversity and environment, history, a co-op internship. From this, students would take the Intensivo, choose two content courses from the, the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth listed, and then the internship would com be completed during the last part of the semester. The South has one PE credit, which is taken during the Intensivo. Thank you, Bryn. Uh, some important program features is that, uh, like many of our programs, um, Spanish-speaking programs, students stay with Oaxacan families. And I would say, uh, Holly asked us to talk about what the favorite features of the program are. And for many students in the Oaxaca program, their Oaxacan families is like lo máximo. Um, academic coursework, um, as I listed, the internship is really unique. There's really not a program in Mexico that offers this opportunity. And then we do group study tours with third party organizations, both that focus on the amazing uh, architectural and archaeological sites of Oaxaca, but also that um, take us to Mexico City and other parts of the country to learn more about the root causes of poverty and immigration, but also what nonprofit, what the nonprofit sector is doing to really alleviate some of the most um, pressing challenges in the country. Um, and a final feature, which is also one of the highlights of the program, is that we participate in the celebrations of the Day of, Dead, of, the, Day of the Dead in Oaxaca, which are absolutely, uh, uh, like, amazing. Um, so I'd say the highlights really are um, the family, the homestays, um, the internship, and the Day of the Dead. Um, among other things. So just a quick picture. This is, uh, picture on the left-hand side is the Instituto Cultural Oaxaca, which is the, our home away from home. It's uh, our campus, basically. The middle shot there is of the salsa class. So by the end of a three-week period, students are actually very, very uh, proficient dancers. And it looks like that last picture got cut off. So we'll move to the next slide so I can finish up. And then the internship experience. Basically, we have a very wonderful internship coordinator that's been working with PLU now for over five years. She comes from the nonprofit sector herself, and she has worked with us, uh, PLU, with our students and with the organizations to develop a really great system for applying and placing students in organizations where there is a need um, for certain skills. So she matches student skills with needs of organizations um, and has helped um, really develop a philosophy around internships that gets us away from imposing too much on our internships, but also uh, works with students to um, mitigate white savior complex, for example. So the picture to the left is um, one of our students who went on to get a Fulbright uh, in Ecuador. It's quite wonderful. All right, next slide. Um, and finally, pictures of the study tour. I would just draw your attention to the beautiful um, archaeological site of Monte Alban uh, that's in the valley on the right-hand side. And I think I'm almost done. Right, Bryn? Currently, PLU alums are working in education, uh, law, specifically migration law, social work, um, among many other uh, wonderful professions. They've done extremely well. So, Bryn, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. If anybody has any questions, I will answer them in the chat. Thanks, Bryn. All right, thank you, Tamara. Um, let's see if there's any questions that we should. Yes, this, this webinar will be available um, after the, the webinar takes place. Um, as Holly mentioned. Okay, so next um, we will discuss the Gateway Trinidad and Tobago program. So I'll introduce uh, Dr. Greg Utes, who is a professor of music and the program director for the Trinidad and Tobago program. Well, greetings, everybody. <clears throat> Uh, 
Holly, are we rolling? Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> um, Holly, I don't know whether we're going to show the PowerPoint or whether you'd like me to do that or shall I just talk? Um, I can get it. I can get it going if you want to start talking. Okay. The Trinidad and Tobago program was founded in the mid to early 1990s and it's been going continuously for 26 or 27 years. It started out as a program uh, for PLU's English department because Trinidad and Tobago in the very southern Caribbean has one of the most spectacular literary traditions uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, an amazing number of famous novelists, poets, and other kinds of writers have come out of Trinidad. Uh, Trinidad is also famous, of course, for its carnival. This is the great last party before Lent. Uh, and Trinidad was one of those places with a magic mixture of European, African, East Indian, uh, Venezuelan populations that came together, all of whom had certain things in common, like festivals, like masquerade, like, like music that is part ritual, part festival. And so um, the, the, the program is a spring program because when students arrive in January, the, um, uh, the, the whole country is already beginning to, to ramp up. Uh, and it's about a six to seven to eight week uh, experience to watch this country slowly just explode into the final days of carnival. So why Trinidad? What kinds of students? Really anybody interested in post-colonial societies. What happens to people who find themselves in what used to be a colony um, and which, which is now having to create a new identity for itself in a, in a global modern world? And one of the most fascinating things about Trinidad's experience with this is the importance of the expressive arts in forming that identity, in expressing that identity both to themselves and to the world. And so Carnival, it turns out, is far more than a big party before Lent. It is, in fact, um, a, a statement of identity. It's a statement, it's a, it's a history of resistance and rebellion and ultimately independence. Uh, and so our students uh, fully participate in the Carnival season and ultimately in the Carnival parades themselves. Um, but uh, Trinidad is also home to the University of the West Indies. And the University of the West Indies is a major uh, R1 research institution, uh, which offers our students the opportunity to take courses in just about anything they need. Yeah, go to the next slide, Holly. Here's some images for you. Um, one of the things that Trinidad invented for its carnival was the steel drums. So anytime you see, see a steel drum being played, that's a Trinidadian invention. In the lower left, you can see pictures of our students dressed up for their carnival parade on Carnival Tuesday. Um, you can also see a beautiful picture of one of Trinidad's many, many beaches. This is almost on the equator. And so year round, Trinidad is somewhere in the 80s. 80 to 90 degrees is typical uh, temperature for Trinidad. And so these beaches, this particular one is on the uh, sister island of Tobago, where we spend about a week in a, a subsistence fishing village or thinking about, about the world from that perspective. We also, of course, uh, spend the entire semester doing probably, I would say, dozens, if not scores of field trips. Here is one of our favorite tour guides telling us about the history of Trinidad and Tobago using a giant a sort of bas-relief sculpture uh, in downtown Port of Spain on the Parliament building. Um, our students uh, also participate in internships, uh, and so here is one of our students at a marine government uh, biology lab uh, doing water quality samples, looking at specimens, etc. Next slide. Um, I think um, the, the that the housing in Trinidad is in a kind of an off-campus but campus dormitory where students share rooms with Trinidadian or other Caribbean uh, students. Um, there's a shuttle bus that takes you to campus. Uh, your, your fees pay for your monthly me meal stipend. So it's pretty much an all included kind of program, including all those study tours. Um, next slide. <clears throat> 
Um, here's a, just a long list of majors at PLU and many other universities around the US, um, all of whose students would probably find Trinidad and Tobago an absolutely amazing place to pursue their own major or their own personal interests. All PLU students in our program take a course that is uh, designed by PLU, but taught by a Trinidadian faculty member. This is Caribbean Culture and Society. And this is the, essentially the, the um, uh, umbrella course, which prepares you for all of your field study, uh, all of your field trips, all of the carnival things, the environmental things, the sustainable agricultural things, the religious festival field trips that you participate in. The second course that everyone takes is called Living and Learning in Trinidad and Tobago, and it puts you in a, um, a live and learn, service learning kind of situation. There are many um, social service agencies that students uh, participate in. There are schools that they act as teachers' aides in. There are laboratories, museums. Uh, there's a, um, a sort of a sustainable agriculture farm that people get involved in. And then just like Oaxaca, we give you a PE credit for all of the dance preparation, all the rehearsal that you do for your carnival experience. Next slide. Again, the University of the West Indies uh, offers you your academic opportunities uh, for specific courses that you need for your major, for gen ed, and again, the internships. Next slide. Here's a, a picture of, of some pictures of the dormitory. There's a shuttle bus that takes you back and forth to campus. There's the, um, the double room that you share with a Caribbean roommate. There's a wall between you, so there is some privacy, but you also learn to make really, really good friends. Uh, most of our students absolutely adore their Caribbean roommates. Uh, nice clean bathrooms there that you can see. Probably looks a bit like a bathroom you know at PLU. Next slide. Uh, I think maybe this is the last slide in this version of the presentation, just another beat shot. <laughs> but uh, I'll just point out another couple of things. Because of the East Indian influence, um, there, there are many, many festivals uh, above and beyond carnival that students take place in, uh, both um, uh, Hindu and Muslim. Uh, and then uh, finally, there's just a lot of, of involvement with people maybe in a scene like this, where uh, Trinidad receives uh, tens of thousands of turtles, leatherback turtles that crawl up on beaches just like this one. And there are villagers who have reinvented themselves from turtle hunting villages to essentially turtle preservation villages. And so this is one of the many uh, sort of environmental things that our students get involved in. So that's a brief overview of Trinidad. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Looks like there are no questions right now, but maybe at, at the end. Um, okay, so with that, we'll move on to the IHAN Oxford program. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Art Strum. Um, so he is, like I said, the program director for the IHAN Oxford program. So I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Bryn. Um, it's really great to hear about these other programs. And I think you can see already that, that each of these programs appeals to different kinds of students. So whatever your interests are, uh, we hope we can address them. I'm going to keep this conversation. I'm not going to offer you images in this case um, or a lot of program details. I urge you, if what I have to say to you in the next few minutes sounds of interest, then please go to the Wong Center pages or you can look at the short uh, film that uh, I, a video I made uh, to outline, give you a sense of the flavor of the program, which you can find on the, the uh, web page. So, um, ION Oxford is the only PLU gateway which, which has been opened only to students of one program or department, but starting in fall of 21, we're going to change that. Um, if there is interest in non-ION students, we'll make this opportunity available to a small number of ION students who are good fits for the program. Um, since ION students have already gotten an introduction to the program um, from me, I'm going to aim this presentation at non-ION students who may have an interest in our program. Let me start by describing why we send students to Oxford in particular. Um, we obviously can't uh, compete with other countries on the weather, <laughs> which is gray and foggy, as some would like Tacoma. Um, I think the most distinctive thing about Oxford, as well as its rival Cambridge, is not that just that it's one of the great universities in the world, which it is, but it's developed a unique form of instruction, the tutorial. Uh, a tutorial is a class, um, 
uh, with just you and the professor in the room. And the focus in this is on developing your own independent powers of judgment, your independent powers of thought, your, your ability to write. What you do is research a particular topic set by your tutor each week, um, and then write a 1,500 to 2,000 word essay. Or in the case of natural sciences or mathematics, it might be that you prepare a problem set. And then you sit with your Oxford tutor and you discuss what you've done, what you've learned, and you have a conversation. Returning students tell me that they are challenged academically like they've never been challenged before in their tutorials. And that it was, as a result, confidence in their own abilities grows. And that's, I think, the, probably the most uh, uh, powerful part, part of our program. Um, I would add that our program is also usually easy to fit into any uh, major or minor because we can find you a tutorial in almost any area of study. So we have students who've done English tutorials or Latin tutorials in humanities. We've had students do many tutorials in gender, sexuality, race studies. We've had many tutorials in biology, geosciences, um, environmental studies, uh, alternative perspectives for gen ed credit. We've had business tutorials, social studies, um, social sciences, history, IR, anthro, so on and so forth. Um, so again, we can, we can find you a tutorial. It's likely that we can find you a tutorial as long as the subject is suited to the tutorial form, we can find you a tutorial. But of course, the program is not only about the tutorial. Um, let me now turn to a general description of the program. You go to Oxford with a PLU faculty member along with 15, 11 to 15 other students. And this program is offered in both fall and spring semesters to accommodate uh, uh, student demand. Uh, you'll take us you, in the beginning of the program, you'll take a six to eight week intensive course with a PLU faculty member or psych director before the Oxford term starts. Um, these courses are interdisciplinary and they're designed by the psych directors to give you a means to read or interpret the place. So it might be that you travel over with a geoscience professor, professor who will help you read the landscape of the UK. It might be that you travel over the professor who has an entirely different specialty. So one of the, the things that's unique about this, this program is that the actual topical focus of the program changes each term. And just as the intensive course changes, the associated study tours change as well are designed uh, to help you again read the play. So some examples of some of the intensive courses and associated study tours in recent years, uh, one is by Dr. Dr. Shaw, um, Britain, the Global South, Colonial Legacies and the Post-Colonial Challenge. That was in spring of 2018. In fall of 2018, Dr. Gerso from IHON in English taught culture capitals, ideas and representations of the University of the Metropolis in 19th and 20th century Britain. And then just last fall, I had the opportunity to serve as site director and taught a course on the remaking of Englishness and Britishness in post-empire Britain, uh, British, Black, and South Asian writing. Um, so each of these intensive courses includes study tours. And what makes a study tour unique is that it's not, it goes beyond seeing the sites. It really gives you opportunities to, to apply what you're learning inside your course to reading a city, reading a landscape, um, 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 and so on. Um, finally, the intensive course is also designed to help prepare you for tutorials because tutorials will start then the second half of the program. Um, uh, in particular, you'll learn to research topics much more quickly and effectively, and you'll begin to learn the, to write uh, what could be called the Oxford essay, an argumentative essay of around 2,000 words in which you uh, position yourself among scholars in the field. Part of the preparation for tutorial involves being inducted into the Bodleian Library, one of the great research libraries of the world, and you'll be able to use those resources during your tutorial. And then um, at the conclusion of the intensive course, you'll also, when you begin the Oxford, Oxford term, you'll also begin your association with one of three Oxford colleges that our program is now associated with. We're associated with St. Anne's, with St. Bennett's, and Regent's Park. Oxford University is a, it has a sort of federal system of 44 different independent colleges that comprise the university itself. We're associated with three of those. You can eat at those colleges. You can take part in sports. We've had many students take part in musical groups. Um, and you have to remember that Oxford, is, as an immense university, has a group to suit whatever interest or identity you bring there. It's likely you can find someone um, uh, uh, who you can, you can commune with there. Um, finally, something about making this program work for you as a non-IHON student, it'll be a bit different. Um, you'll want to work with me and your major and minor departments to make sure that you can count one of the tutorials uh, for your program that are one of the tutorials counts for ION students automatically as an ION course, and that wouldn't be the case for non-ION students. But again, this shouldn't be a problem as long as you choose those tutorials carefully and work with your department. Uh, secondly, you'll also perhaps want to choose a semester when the intensive course and study tours are of particular interest to you. So choose a topic that's of interest to you. 
either because you can um, you can count that intensive course for your major or minor, um, or uh, alternately you counter this PLU elective credit, or even in some cases as a gen ed requirement. So in conclusion, something about what kind of student uh, might be attracted to this program. I think above all, if you're good, if you like independence, if you're a good independent learner, and you like the idea of working in uninterrupted fashion on a particular topic of interest to you, without the distractions of exams, distractions of quizzes, so on and so forth, then this program may appeal to you. The living situation is also independent. You're living in a vibrant uh, mid-sized city of Oxford um, with other PLU students, but you have the attractions of, of Oxford um, right outside your doorway. And that's also something that students find quite attractive about the program. So if you have an interest, uh, please get in touch with me or get in touch with, with uh, Bryn or Holly in the Wong Center. Thanks very much. Thank you, Art. Um, so next we'll move on to Oslo, Norway, and we'll speak with Dr. Ami Shah, who actually was a site director in Oxford. Um, so she's a faculty member in the Departments of Anthropology and Global Studies and the program director for our Oslo Gateway Program. Hi, Bren, thank you. Um, I, I'm just listening to all of these and as a Global Studies professor, I've had students be on every single one of these gateways. So, um, I'll, I'll kind of reiterate what Dr. Strom said, that these gateway programs are all amazing and they all offer something different. Um, so really think about what your interests are and what might kind of meld best with those. He kind of joked that um, Oxford can't compete with places for weather. Oslo definitely cannot. You are very far north um, and you are there in the fall semester. So it gets increasingly dark um, as the semester goes on, of course. The program is focusing on peace and conflict studies uh, and it is located at Bjorknes College, which is in the city of Oslo. The courses are really fantastic for students who are interested in current events um, or who are interested in kind of the theories and philosophy behind how the world works. Um, usual courses include things like international political theory or international political thought, uh, terrorism and counterterrorism. There's been a course on the ethics of war and peace. And they actually have somebody on faculty who used to be on the committee for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, it's a rotating committee. Um, and he's taught classes on the history of the prize and the politics of it as well. So in terms of what kind of PLU programs really work well with that. Um, we've had a lot of global studies students go, especially those who are concentrating in international affairs. Depending on the courses offered every year, there's sometimes when it could fit into other concentrations. We've had political science students, um, philosophy as well. Um, sometimes students who are kind of interested in these types of international issues and bringing them into their own degree um, will also take it. It's also a really, really cool chance to just kind of think about how the world views the United States and really step out of viewing everything from the perspective of the United States. So if you're kind of curious about what the world thinks of us, this might be a good program for you as well. So in covering the courses, I've kind of covered some of the things that students learn. Um, the students' engagement with the host community is really different than some of our other programs. Students do not live with a host family, and the program is taught all in English. However, you're also immersed in a very European style of education, and thus a kind of a European style of organizing universities, etc. So this program is suited for independent learners, but it's not quite as independent as Oxford. There is still a lot of interaction with your professors. You usually take three courses and then some um, audit a fourth course. And those courses are usually worth five credits each. So they're quite intensive. You usually meet once a week for three hours. Um, and that includes kind of a lecture and discussion time, sometimes meetings with professors, etc. Um, and you're really kind of left on your own and trusted to do the reading, to prepare for the exams and the writing, et cetera. So you need to be somewhat independently motivated, um, but you also get kind of more one-on-one -on -one time if you need it with the professors. The host community 
living situation is really what makes this unique. Oslo has uh, kind of joined all of its universities in a particular way. So anybody who's going to college or university in Oslo kind of applies to a particular pool of housing and students then get placed in housing all over the city. So our PLU students are all placed in the same housing location. They may or may not be on the same floor or even in the same building, but then you also have students with you who are other um, visitors to Bjorknes, as well as who are attending university all throughout Oslo. So it's very cool in that way. Um, and you get to meet students from all over the world, really, who are taking classes. This does mean that you also have access to all of those other universities. So you can go, for example, to the University of Oslo Library to work, which is beautiful downtown, kind of in the nice, um, fancy area of town, if you will. You also have access to the Nobel Institute Library too, which is super cool, to the archives there. You can even go study there if you want to. So it's really neat kind of having that access. Um, students' favorite aspects of this program really start first and foremost with the people of Bjorkness. My students love the faculty. I joke that I would trust the faculty there with my own little kids because they are so kind, so caring, so thoughtful. Um, yeah, they're, they're just absolutely wonderful and they do everything they can to make you feel welcome. They meet you at the airport. They make sure you have the stuff that you need um, to like cook, et cetera, so you don't have to take pans and stuff with you, for example. Um, they're, they're just really kind and caring. They always host a American Thanksgiving dinner for their American students who are visiting. So that's really the first thing. The second thing is Oslo is just a super cool city. It's big, but it's also very, very walkable. And it has everything from the King's Palace grounds, which you can literally just walk through the parks around the King's Palace, or, um, kind of more, if you will, artsy, independent kind of areas of town, more places where there's a variety of different uh, migrants living, etc. So you kind of have all of that big city vibe plus cool museums, etc. Yet you can also hop on a train or even on public transport just within the city, a bus or a ferry, and get to really great hiking spots, a place to swim in a lake outside, um, it is just really, really stunning. And of course, anywhere in Europe is just a really easy, easy hop off point to travel further within Europe as well. And I'll stop there. If you have questions, please feel free to contact me. Thanks, Bryn. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. All right, so we're gonna stay in Norway, but move to a more rural part of Norway. Um, so with that, I'll introduce Dr. Mike Behrens, who's a professor of biology and the program director for the USN Gateway Program. Thanks, Bryn. Um, Bryn, can you just verify that you're seeing Norway slides since it's great? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so um, I'm going to talk to you about our programs um, through the University of Southeast Norway. Um, these programs are a little bit different than the other gateway programs for a number of reasons, but um, one of them is that um, they are through a, a university system rather than a single university. So we send students to do two different campuses uh, and, and they're both relatively rural campuses, one in Ba and one um, Vestvold, with the nearest city being Tunsberg. Uh, so they also, they differ in that um, Ba is in the Telemark region. So a little bit more Alpine, a little bit more mountainy, um, and Vestvold is, is on the coast, actually. So, um, so different locations, and those different locations um, also pair with um, different academic opportunities there. And so in terms of the qualities or academic interests um, that could make a student a strong fit for, for this program, um, it's, it's pretty variable. And... Um, to advance. Um, so we'll start out um, with the, the campus, the, the Ba campus that um, we've had the longest history with and has the most varied opportunities. Um, and 
like POU or many Western universities, um, each of these campuses is not comprehensive, meaning that all majors are offered in each location. So these are um, different tracks students can study. Um, also, unlike um, many of our, um, our comprehensive universities of the West, um, you basically take classes within that really it um, with one caveat and that is the ability to study Norwegian language um, from any of these tracks. So um, one fairly popular track for um, students in the natural sciences is the Alpine Ecology and Environmental Management um, track and, and that is a, a primarily a fall track is probably the best time to do that especially for budget majors. Um, you can take as many as three upper division um, biology courses. And I, I forgot to mention one of the, um, the nice things about this program is that um, like our other Norwegian program, it is all in English. And so, um, so there is no language requirement um, to study here. Um, it's also possible that um, the chemistry might work in the spring, environmental studies um, majors or minors um, can pick up courses that fit really well. Uh, it's also a leadership um, program that has uh, some culture and eco philosophy mixed in. It can be fall or spring. It is primarily for kinesiology students. Um, and it is really about learning to lead groups of um, of people in the outdoors. And the really neat thing about this is depending on whether you're there in fall or in spring, um, it changes the types of outdoor activities that you do. Because as Ami mentioned about Norway, you start out in fall and it's warm, um, and then it starts getting dark and cold. And so that is your experience in fall and spring, it starts out dark and cold and then gets warm. And so the, the programs are, um, are catered around that. There are also opportunities for um, business majors at PLU to study at this campus, um, and especially around marketing and management. But pretty much all of their business courses are, are open to our students that would want to take um, international tourism and sustainable development works well primarily with environmental studies, but can work with biology and business as well. Um, it takes a little bit um, more work to have that, that work out for those others, but it, it is possible. Finally, Scandinavian studies or Nordic studies, um, and, and this is heavy into Norwegian language and, and culture. Um, and, and history, and so, um, and this is the, the program, so um, you can take Norwegian language through any of the, the other tracks as well. Um, if we move to the, the next campus, the Vestfold campus, and I mentioned this one is, is on the coast, um, and while the Telemark region where Bø is, um, is sort of known as Norway in miniature, because of all of the, the various habitats you can see. Um, the, the Vestfold campus, um, it has, Vestfold has a claim to fame, it's a Viking history, and many of the Viking ships that have been unearthed in Norway have actually been unearthed out of this region. Um, its closest city is the, the city of Tunsberg. This is the waterfront there um, that actually has replica um, Viking ships that you can just walk onto. Um, it also has a history of um, Germanic um, trade along the waterfront, um, which is an interesting history as well. Um, in terms of programs there, um, this is really focused on kinesiology majors, and it is a fall-only program in exercise and health management, um, and a little bit of adaptive health or health across the, the lifespan built into that. Um, in terms of how students engage with their host communities, um, the, that really is through the living situation in both these programs. Um, students live in um, housing um, 
that is run through HSN, which is um, the Norwegian government's sort of arm of, um, of student welfare um, around the country for their state schools. And um, living in style housing, usually with Norwegian students and often with students from other countries as well. And so um, we try and keep our students from being in the same apartment with one another um, so that you sort of have some forced interaction there. And, and we find that the students actually really enjoy that, even if it's um, a little bit uncomfortable at first. Um, one of the, I think, the favorite aspects in either one of these locations is the ability to easily um, move around Norway through the rail system, as well as using Oslo as a jumping off point to travel other places. And, um, and then mixing that with the people that you meet um, in your classes, in your living situations, and, and, and those other experiences. And I think I will wrap it up there with um, pictures of, yes, it does get snowy. Um, and, and it gets snowy and dark. And so you, you start um, in, in August and it's, it's really warm and you end with it being um, snowy and dark in, in December. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Behrens. Um, okay, so our final uh, program that we're going to learn about today is in Namibia. So I would like to introduce Dr. Jan Weiss, who is the Associate Dean of Education and also the Program Director for the Namibia Program. So thank you. So it's interesting that if you come from Norway, um, at the end of that program, you actually start the Namibia Program in January, which is the heat of the summer, and it's boiling hot when you walk off the plane. And I do have a slide show if I can see if I can share my screen. Um, just a second. Oh, let me. Um, I'm not sharing my screen yet. Is that correct? Oh, here we go. That's correct. All righty. Now I think I am. Um, I'm just trying to figure out if I can. I've been challenged with um, sharing these days. Um, well, we'll just see it this way. So this. Um, when I think about Namibia, I thought it was very interesting that Paul started and talking about why people might go to China. Um, some people might have similar feelings of choosing Namibia. It's a country that a lot of students say to me they would never have gone to an African country without a study away program. So that's, um, that's always one of the um, features of why people are choosing to come to Namibia. I first went to Namibia as a Fulbright Scholar a program in 2010, and I had to look up where the country was. It's really in the south of Africa, um, so it's a long flight. You can't get there quickly, um, and the program actually takes place in Windhoek, which is right smack in the middle of the country, so we have access to all kinds of um, places that we can travel to, um, but we are in a major city which often people will say doesn't feel like you're in Africa until you move 20 minutes outside of the city. And then all of a sudden you're hiking with wildebeest and giraffe and you know you're not in any other place. Um, so I just wanted to say some special aspects of the Namibia Gateway Program. PLU has had long-term connections with Namibia. Um, They've deepened through J-term student teaching, and then the semester program has um, been in existence since 2015, and we maintain a lot of uh, Department of State connections. Um, we, we, being PLU, hosted eight Namibians in 1988 through 1992 to study in, earn their undergraduate degree, and we actually hosted another Namibian who earned her master's in education. It's a relatively young democracy. It's been independent for 25 years. And so anybody that is interested in looking at how a country um, where the has been ruled by a minority, there's about 7% white people, 
um, has become an independent country that is ruled by uh, Namibians. And so that's always fascinating to be part of that culture. It allows for a lot of global opportunities, natural sciences, social sciences, and education. So I, I don't know why I can't do it the regular side, but that's fine. So the program is organized. We are at the University of Namibia, which is 24 years old. It was formed a year after independence. It's its own big campus. The main campus is in Windhoek, um, but they have 13 other campuses. We don't tend to visit those. Um, the one unique aspect is we do go in January. The university doesn't start its first semester term until February. So we have the month um, with Dr. Martha Akawa, who is the head of department for history. She's the associate um, dean of humanities now. And when people talk about what are some of the favorite aspects, Martha's name always come, comes up. She teaches them the history of Namibia. So you have an understanding of the context that you're actually um, going to be living in for the next four months. And she brings people to her home. I don't know if any of you heard her speak yesterday, I think it was, that she said her two young children are wondering what's happening to the Americans because they left in March and they're not coming back. So she's an integral part of the program. Students also are able to do an internship they can volunteer, they can participate in faculty student research. Those education students that come are in the um, in schools. We have host family and that's a real loose term because we have people that have been familiar with our program that make really strong connections with our students and involve them in any kind of activities that they're doing. We have two study tours. One goes to the north of the country, and we learn a lot about the environment and what, how Namibia is really focused on conserving land and letting the people take over that. We also have a weekend rural homestay. So it is definitely rural. The first time I went, I was surprised that um, I thought, wow, this is rural. I, we partner with the Center for Global Education um, out of Augsburg College, so they've done this for a long time, and that's also a highlight. Um, we have students that still keep in contact with their host families from um, Korihas. In the middle of the semester, we go to the south, which is, uh, we climb the dunes, and that this is the background of my slides. It's my favorite part of the country. Um, it's peaceful, it's gorgeous, and the students really like that. They get to do some camping, so the stars are gorgeous, and um, they are really learning more about the environment and how Namibians need to be stewards of their country. There's additional workshops, um, a batik workshop, and learning an indige indigenous way of doing batik is also another highlight, but there are day trips. We go hiking. Um, there's one of my favorite places is um, just outside of the city and um, the animals roam with you as you hike. Um, it's very safe, although my daughter might argue with me that when I was there as a Fulbright, she was sure baboons were going to get us, but we've always, we learn how to be safe around animals. Um, there's a lot of internship and field work possibilities. Um, we've had a student um, that worked with the Ministry, Ministry of Environment and Tourism and looked at um, the fate of lions and how they were faring in Namibia compared to other countries. There is Nankuse, which is 45 minutes away. It's an animal conservation sanctuary, and we learned from the founder of that. We've had people work in with HIV AIDS, non you know, NGOs. We had people this year in the hospitals doing research. So there's all kinds of opportunities. And I really say whatever type of internship you might be interested in, you talk to me and we talk with our site coordinator that um, works um, pretty closely with um, helping establish internships. 
And I think that is it. I cut a lot of slides as we were going, so to make it short, and if there are any other questions, um, people can, I think I tried to weave all those things in, so I was cognizant of the time. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, all right, so that is what we have to share with you about our PLU Gateway programs, and we hope you found this information interesting and helpful. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat right now or in the Q&A box, although we know we're at time. Um, so if you're curious where you should be going from here, I recommend that you set up an, an advising session with Holly Peterson, who's the SteadyWay advisor in the Wong Center. Um, also, I would, I would recommend that you continue to do your, your research. So look at programs, evaluate what you want, um, and Holly is here as a resource for you. And we're all actually here as resources for you. So with that, I will leave you with the application deadline, which is March 15th. Um, and that's for all programs for the following academic year. You can find all of this information on our website at plu.edu slash studyaway. It looks like there are no questions. So with that, I will say goodbye and thank you.